I know y'all will want to ask about the trades. Obviously, we know the rules on that, so we won't be able to really elaborate on that. We'll talk about free agency, you know, and, and free agency. I know you will want to do that. Again, uh, we'll not share a lot of details, but we'll try to definitely uh, share some context uh, of, of this probably un- unprecedented uh, year, but there's also some similarities, and I'm sure we'll get into uh, maybe the the draft and 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 the uh, probably the adjustments we're having to make in that process and things like that. So uh, that's the that's how we'll open. I think we'll go f- with questions from there. Omar, we'll start with you. Hey, last thanks for making the time. <clears throat> you know, obviously Sean, you know, has his offensive system, and within that system, the different position groups. You know that you'd like certain traits and characteristics at those positions. I'm wondering how much the quarterback skill set affects, you know, what type of players and skill sets you put around the quarterback as you approach free agency in the draft uh, here upcoming. The, the, I think the we I, I I like to keep it simple, really, especially when you talk about offense and, and the five the eligibles. And the, the reason I always use a basketball analogy. Right, just because it's actually five, and and you, you're trying to build the best basketball team, and and and, and again, system uh, comes into play, philosophy comes into play, who you actually have uh, on your or in your lineup on your roster presently comes into play, right? So, do, do we need a shooting guard? Do we need a rebounder? Do you need a center? Do you, you know things like that? So, I, I think there's different flavors and genres uh, that you look at. And, and try to assess and and the quarterback we can talk at nauseum uh, about it right uh, and and try to to figure out all the characteristics that make a, a great QB but uh, that definitely probably uh, matters and I'll keep it as simple as right when you have someone uh, let's call it when you have someone really big maybe Steve McNair in his day and, and there's a chance for a guy who's 250 pounds to to not get sacked, break tackles, uh, you know, go east and west, keep plays alive, has a really strong arm. Maybe maybe it's it's good to to have a a, a subset of receivers maybe that are, are larger, bigger, right? So you know he can he can throw it up things like that. So there's definitely some nuances in in the flavor of QB that that you you would have to build around too. Uh, uh, to, let's call it to, to maximize the strength of, of the 11 people playing on offense for you. And probably more than 11, right? You get the 12 because they're slot receivers. Yeah. You get the 13 because there's a, a second tight end. You get the 14, maybe a, you know, a third tight end fullback, right? You get the 15 because you may, you may go three wide, I mean, four wide receivers sometimes. So yeah. this game's gotten sophisticated. Good question, though. Hey, Gary. You may be on mute, Gary. I am. Hey, um, How many times have you heard that? I know we can't get into, uh, or you can't get into the specifics of, uh, of trade, but... Um, there has been no trade. Still your, technically still on your roster, so when was the decision made uh, to move on? From I, you know what, I'm not going to get, I mean, as we said earlier, Gary, I think that, that'll be a, a better uh, time for you know, when we can actually discuss it. I, I, it was kind of right. tippy-toeing yes. around it based actually, on the rules. That'll happen when you're introducing, you know, Matthew Stafford. I think we'd all like to kind of, kind of get this part of the situation, at least as much of it as we can, kind of straight. Hey, Artis, who's our, who's our PR guy at the league? Hey, but, hey, Gary, will you call Mike up? I've been trying to get Mike to let us talk, and you could say it's a slightly archaic rule. Uh, I totally understand the, the nuances of the rule, uh, for sure. Uh, when you look at the – when you read the paragraph that the management council uh, described, right? So, But we're, we'll respect that. Why the organization 
you know, decided that it was, if it might be time for a, for a new look, without getting into the specifics of any kind of deal. I, I think, it, it, again, artist, would you please give me Mike's number? Let's call Mike right now. Get Mike on speaker. Yeah. You know what, Kevin? I think I, I think you all know me. I, I've never. I mean, I, I'm a relatively open person. I'll, you know, there's some things obviously we're, you're not going to ever discuss in public. You're going to keep within the walls. But it, it's hard to address this uh, tippy toeing around it and, and things like that. I mean, I think that's a better question, and, and, and certainly don't mind sitting down at that point in time and, and discussing. Right. Obviously, because, you know, what we're talking about is a big move and, and definitely deserves to be talked about uh, at the right time. I can say I agree. I, I do think it would be nice to be able uh, to talk about it just because uh, the move was right. Uh, agreed upon, it seems like forever ago, and we still can't talk about it but I'm going to respect those rules. And, and hopefully by respecting them, we might can uh, uh, have a chance of evolving uh, or being a part of the evolution of some of these these rules if this is the way the uh, cycle of roster movement is going to go in the future. Well, let me try a, a, maybe a safer topic. Now that the salary cap... Why would that be unsafe? I didn't make the rules. <laughs> I understand. Uh, now that the salary cap is set, can you kind of give us an overview... Uh, the Rams challenges and any opportunities uh, that might be different this year? You talk, you call it an unprecedented year. Well, I think the unprecedented part being uh, for the first time modern era, right, the, the cap the cap decreases in, instead of increases. Uh, but, again, I think many people uh, on this planet, not just us in NFL football, have had to make sacrifices, uh, some probably harder than others over the past year. So, and again, I think uh, in history, right, uh, generations before us have had to make sacrifices, uh, you know, for uh, unprecedented circumstances and, and, and probably, you know, those, those sacrifices paid off to help make a stronger place. So that, that's the unprecedented part with the, with the, with the cap, uh, you know, definitely going down. So that that has, uh, you know, that's definitely, you know, uh, basically spurned us to to have to make uh, d difficult decisions uh, and and actually have some difficult uh, uh, discussions with, with current players and, and, and figure out if we can, uh, you know, goal number one for us is to get under the cap so that we can uh, maybe begin – uh, re-signing some of the players we want to, but take take the unprecedented pandemic uh, uh, situation circumstances out of it. I do think uh, this is where we are as an organization, as a football team, right now moving forward. Is uh, every year, even when the cap does go up, there's going to be uh, right players. A lot of the guys we'll talk about, or you might want to talk about specifically, right. Uh, and we're talking about them is because, right, heck, Sean and his coaching staff penciled them into probably a very significant role uh, in previous seasons. And, and it, you know, we may be uh, basically uh, forced to allow them to move on or choose other players and not some and, and things like that. And that's that's all what we're working through now. Now have access to us again after they were all canceled last year. But 
with having that access, again, I believe you guys are also, everybody across the league is operating under the constraints of being only allowed uh, three members of, of their respective organization being able to attend those pro days. What is the impact of those constraints? And along those same lines, how are you guys kind of um, delegating or, or assigning and, and figuring out who goes to um, those pro days and who kind of fills those spots? It, we have, it's interesting with pro days just because uh, a lot of times, right, different than this year, there, there's been a combine, so uh, do you need a pro day? Do you need to attend a pro day? Do you not? And I think for every pro day attended, uh, there, there, there should be a specific reason, uh, right? Uh, maybe uh, the case or the file on that player uh, is not necessarily complete yet. Is there anything that, can, that we can get from a pro day to... to to complete that file to help us be more certain, uh, you know that 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 play that we could onboard that player and, and he uh, become a contributor for. Us. So uh, there's many different. So the the interesting thing this year, no combine. So the all pro days we will share data, uh, but that occurs every year uh, in in a system that's referred to as the APT system, where every club doesn't have to attend a pro day, but let's call it a player subset school didn't go to the combine, we, we can get the standard 40-yard dash, standard short shuttles, and, and, and that data shared. So I think this year, right, eh, unlike the combine, some of those numbers, some of those measurables will just uh, get to us later in the, in the process. And then as a club, there is times where uh, maybe you don't want to attend a pro day uh, just because you don't – you, you don't want to show your cards or what have you and, and things like that. So there's always some of that uh, game theory, you know, going on. So uh, nothing different than in, than in years past because in most situations, uh, we probably haven't sent three to a pro day uh, anyway. But I do think because there's no private workouts this year, uh, you know, that you, you you cap there's definitely a cap but maybe allow three because uh, a lot of times with position coaches coordinators even head coaches if they wanted to get out to a pro day they they could but a lot of time nowadays that is done somewhat privately to try to keep right uh, Stu maybe even Gary once he gets over uh, uh, the NFL's rules we're gonna get my man Mike on speakerphone before this is over artist because I want him to you know, kind of get Gary back into this thing for me. But what we try to do is keep people go, oh, the, the Rams had, uh, you know, defense coordinator, offense coordinator at this position, and now now teams teams will take note of that and, and try to use that against you maybe. Jordan. Hey, Les, I've got a couple questions for you, if you don't mind. Um, so... When you separate free agency from sort of your draft preparation and obviously with free agency setting up that draft process and your board, where are some of the, the priority positions for you, um, first in free agency and then second, where you think you might start looking in the draft at that point? I, I think the I don't want to get in. I can't, I can't totally do that uh, without – Right, given maybe giving some teams a leg up in in the draft if they wanted to move up and jump us per se at a position, uh, but there's a, there's some uh, definitely some players that we feel like we have a shot once we get under the cap uh, to re-sign uh, uh, it during the uh, either before the bell rings of the if you uh, whatever we call that that period where we can negotiate. I hate calling it the legal tampering period because that just seems. It just seems like that's a debacle of the English language, legal tampering. If tampering is illegal, but uh, so we will, we'll, we will, and then we have to adjust uh, based on that because there's no guarantee that you can resign. But I think we would love to get to from a big picture standpoint, and we're very close to uh, in the draft where, you, for the most part, there is uh, a lot of returning starters. Uh, returning so that when you do go to the draft, uh, right, let's call it there's multiple positions alive each time you pick. Uh, because if you – and there, it's not going to be the case always, but when you do take uh, 
positions, you know, out of the mix, uh, there is a chance that you could pass on, you know, a really good player at another position who might not necessarily help you day one, uh, but could really begin to contribute somewhere during the season and even become a, a valuable starter for you, you know, down the line. A, a free agent that we have this year, John Johnson's a great example of that, right? When we, when we drafted him back in 17, we, we had starting safeties, but uh, it was one of those, hey, that, that he's a, we really like this player. We think, and I always say there's, there's, there's not a good reason not to take a really good football player. Uh, that player usually finds a way to contrib- contribute. And somewhere along the way, I think it was, I still remember post Dallas game. Maybe it was the Dallas game where uh, you know we we inserted John into the starting lineup over you know a previous starter, and it worked out. And then um, in terms of financial navigation. Um, are you guys now in the process of maybe restructuring? Is that your priority um, to lean toward restructuring of contracts to get under versus some of the maybe tougher um, decisions? That yes, that would be to? that would be priority number one. Uh, and so that that's the that's the process that's occurring now. Our our, our vision is to get there without having uh, to do that. Uh, but again. And if we have to do that again, uh, player agent definitely knows that. Right, there is a, there is a there is a timeline, there is a deadline, and and we have to be under the cap. So, if we can't work something out, you know, uh, before then, that's a possibility. We definitely didn't want to surprise anyone. Right, uh, again, it, 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 hey, this has been an ongoing process probably for the last, right, really, getting getting into the weeds the last you know two or three weeks trying to work with everyone to to come up with win-win solutions for, you know, uh, player and club at this point in time. And if, if you guys will forgive me, just one more. Um, I understand you can't talk about the, the quarterback situation, and um, I'm, you know, I, I know the rule. But, um, Isn't that weird? When, as you're evaluating, like, obviously you've got a new set of evaluations of how can we make someone new in our system be successful. Um what sort of traits do you think are, are needed in your offense in order to best maximize that particular skill set that of the person you can't talk about? I wonder what number he's going to wear. Uh, <laughs> the uh, I think I think you know what it's interesting. Once we're able to, uh, I, I think the first part of that question is 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 Sean and his coaching staff right now. And this is, this is probably been probably one of the benefits of not, of not doing a, a combine. And there's, and there's a lot of benefits that you try to find the, the roses of maybe the thorns that we're going through, but uh, by, by let's call it any, an entire organization moving uh, to Indy for, you know, over a week and then what taking about a week to recover from Indy, uh, you know, it, it is allowed you know the the coaching staff right to get on to get to let's call it watching the upcoming players in the draft play football. Uh, you know, get to that, get to the film quicker, and probably in a more uh, you know quality and, and uh, focused environment. But it's also allowed them to begin looking at the just the overall scheme and what what maybe Sean and his staff want to do differently. So and, and that's even probably taking uh, the QB out. Uh, I do think. Uh, Depending on what you think the your QBs and, and every player is different, right? We say it a lot, right? What's the what's the what's the player's superpower, or one to two to three, or, or however many they, there are, and, and and all of us, right, have an element of kryptonite to us, and and you try to you try to definitely put those players in positions to use those superpowers, and then and again, how can uh, you know how can the five eligibles that are going to be on the field at the time you know, enhance uh, that process. I call it a, make our short, if, if our offense is a sword, you want those five eligibles and, and they don't have to be the same five eligibles at the same time, but you want those players to, you know, make that sword sharper. Lindsay. Hey, Les. Hey, Lindsay. Uh, what was your reaction when the uh, salary cap was actually set? 
was your actually the number? You know, it, it, uh, my uh, stepson Tate asked me this morning when he said, "Hey, does that 2.5 million help you?" I'm like, "No, I don't think the 2.5 is really going to help us if you kind of look at where we are and you know look at how much we're over." So, 2.5 is probably a little bit of a drop in the bucket. I do think uh, along the way, Lindsay, we we always worked on uh, okay. What was the first minimum? 170. Or was it 175? I, now I forgot. But we'd always said, look, let's let's build models, uh, design models, engineer models, where we got to get to that original minimum. And then when when the news did break that uh, right, the, the minimum now was going to be 180, that did allow us to right uh, get a little more breathing room without having to make sacrifices or or, or tougher sacrifices within. But we've always worked off of the, the minimum model. So I do think uh, that's helped along the way. That was about probably a week ago or the, in the, within the last few weeks. But the, today's news is, is the, the extra $2.5 million uh, doesn't necessarily going to really move the needle with us. Uh, but it, it is very, very helpful now to know that, okay, it's not going to be 188 per se that w would have been a little more breathing room. So it, that is to, to know now we, we know, we know what the finish line is. So we've been running a marathon right now and didn't know whether we were going to run, you know, 25 miles, 24, 26 or 28. So at least now we know it's 26.2 and let's roll. Uh, and then several teams are at the stage right now where they're obviously trying to get under the cap and letting go of veteran players. I'm wondering if you have had any discussions and have had to inform any of your probably veteran players right now that they will not be returning. Yeah, we've definitely had uh, discussions with, right, and it's interesting, right? You, they haven't been with players, right, uh, on rookie contracts uh, because, you know, deleting those contracts, uh, you know, do not help a team in terms of cap uh, for the most part. So uh, what makes this unprecedented, right? You, you, we've had to, we've had to knock on the door of a lot of our key, you know, figures, key pillars and, and, and ask him to, in some cases, make sacrifices and in, in some cases, adjust uh, their contract to help us get under the cap. And, and the division right now is to get to the finish line without having uh to release players. And with that being said, Lindsay, we well aware that we've had to have some calls with a subset of our less unrestricted free agents, uh, right, and, and, and restricted free agents, and, and let them know our intent, whether we were going to be attempting to resign them or uh, assuming they're going to have a better market than what we would be able to pay and, and allowing them to, 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 to know their path and how they – need to move forward so that's where we're at but it, it, it's evolving it's changing it's, it's unprecedented but I, I do think uh, the positive thing is I think everybody in the environment ecosystem realizes uh, this is different this is tougher so I think all of us have been willing to somewhat make sacrifices somewhat think out of the box uh, that wouldn't necessarily normally occur in a normal year I think the first of all, right, you, you got to have cap room to use the franchise tag. Uh, so uh, that's that's number one. And I, I think I had mentioned to someone earlier that strategically, probably philosophically, you'd love to be able to to not utilize the the franchise tag and and work to get something done. Uh, you know, long term, just because usually when there's a, a franchise tag used, it, it's it just the the history of it says it's very hard to to get something done longer term off of that tag. Uh, and one of the reasons because of that is is whatever the tag is, a lot of times uh, 
player, player rep knows, okay, that, that's, a, that's the P5 for one year and, and to get something long-term, maybe, hey, we want more than that, uh, you know, P5 over the long-term, where a lot of times uh, a longer-term deal, there may be less, you know, less P5, but more guaranteed things like that. So uh, I think that's, that would be the, uh, the reason not to and, and try to come up with a, with a win-win to, to ha- not, ha- I would say not have to go through it again. If, if you tag someone, they stay on the tag, then we're going to, you know, you're going to go through the, the, the process again in a year. So I think uh, when you're constructing the team uh, for not necessarily just a microscopic 2021 season, but, you know, with the telescope in mind, you, we'd love to, to know on a few of these players that there's there's an element of certainty that, uh, right, they're going to be around longer there, you know, that, that affects how you might draft, might not draft and, you know, in this draft. So that would be the reason, but you got, you definitely got to have cap room to, to use the tag. And, uh, and even when you do have cap room and you use the tag, I mean, that's definitely a lot of cap that goes to a single player, but from the offense uh, last season was a, a deep threat. Uh, so will finding a receiver uh, in free agency or the draft uh, that can fill that role, will, will, I know you'll want to talk about your specific priorities, but is that, is that an area that you guys are going to be looking to improve? Yeah, we definitely have discussed that, you know, based on, you know, in, in looking at, and, and I think I know Sean had used Brandon Cooks and, you know, going back to 18, and, and then even in 19, Brandon was was uh, uh, you know he didn't play every game based on you know some of the injuries. So it was really you know starting in 19, even 20, uh, and going back to even when Sammy Watkins was here. And so it, I would say this deep deep threat can be many things, right? It's not just speed and throwing the ball deep, uh, right? There's an element if there's a vertical presence. Whether I mean the guy might. Might not be as fast, but he but he's tall and big, and he can go get a rebound, and you can you can throw the ball up. But when there's an element of a vertical presence, and they come in all shapes and sizes, uh, it definitely loosens the defense. There there has to be uh, the defense coordinator, defensive staff will want to protect. Right, you want to protect explosions. The analytics say if you the more explosions, um, explosive plays you have, the better chance you have to win along with turnover. So what that actually does, even even though a, a, a Sammy Watkins back in 17, you know, Brandon in 18 even, it's, let's just say Brandon had a lot, let's call it a lot more yards than Sammy did. And I know, uh, you know, in 17 and 18, but it's not necessarily just the yards that those players are, are actually catching. It, it's what they're doing to the to the enemy. And then that does loosen up some things underneath but again that can come uh you know the uh, the new england patriots maybe made that happen with a with a freak tight end right so it when when you say that uh gary doesn't have to just be a let's call it a speed receiver but i think we're all saying the same thing there's an element of presence vertically that that you know the defense now has to ensure against and that usually means uh uh, less compact, more space, uh, and you know more alleys to throw to the shorter intermediate stuff. And then, um, in, in terms of you know you're saying the restructures wouldn't be with guys on rookie contracts. Um, would you know Andrew Whitworth, Michael Brockers, maybe Rob Havenstein? Are those the kinds of players we're talking about that are uh, you're in discussions with in terms of restructures? Yeah, I want to. I want to. I mean, definitely keep. Not going to mention any names here, but uh, right, the, uh, a rookie contract doesn't help you with the cap. So it's definitely it's definitely veterans who are who are uh, on their second, maybe even third uh, 
contracts, and, and those are the ones that can help you uh, write, uh, let's call it, gain cap space in the immediate. So. Yeah, there, I think it's a probably a combination of both, right, uh, with some of our higher paid players. And in, in, I mean, uh, hey, if, if Aaron Donald, that's probably one that's gone right. Uh, Jalen Ramsey, right, one that that's gone right. So there, the plan there, there is an element. Hey, who are some of your pillars? Who are some of the core players, uh, right, that you're going to somewhat build schemes around? Uh, Right, maybe strike fear, maybe change the math uh, of the enemy, and 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 that's that's part of it. Uh, and and you definitely realize when you when you do that. I think number one is we, we to 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 do this plan per se. Uh, we definitely needed to break through, right? We definitely needed to and break through. I mean, it, prove you can win, and not just win one year, but prove you can. You can be, I call it a contender for a division uh, more than once. And, th and then at that point, it is probably sound to begin going, okay, we're, we're in this window. And again, when I say contend, I'm, I'm c contending for divisions. But, okay, let, let's keep this subset together. With that comes, yes, there's going to be uh, some mistakes along the way, and that's where uh, some of the uh, dead money uh, – comes into doesn't necessarily you know and then sometimes write them does it there could be a subset where some of those players really helped uh but then post contract doesn't didn't help as much you know for unforeseen circumstances or things like that so uh but that's where the dead money comes into but i do think whether there's a lot of dead money or not and we see it with teams uh that are maybe in this uh window is right they're going to have players that play for them they're going to not be able to uh re-sign them so at that point in time you definitely know that there's going to be changeover every every year so what we've tried to do too uh is is know that uh so if we lose uh uh good veteran players in free agency and and i think we you've heard us say try to play the comp formula right so with that being said, instead of uh, maybe replacing a player we lose in unrestricted free agency with another unrestricted free agent, right? So uh, whether you now replace that player with a, a free agent who's not an unrestricted that doesn't affect the comp formula and, uh, or a rookie or maybe uh, Sebastian Joseph who wasn't necessarily a rookie but he was a sophomore. He was coming into his sophomore season, a little lesser known because, right, that that if you kind of spend that rookie season as a red shirt, you know that that sophomore type player is not as sexy, not as known, right? Nothing against that. So that's kind of the the model. But by by, by being able to be disciplined with the comp for me, I do think, uh, uh, and I know Lindsay, you, uh, I did read your article, did a nice job of of kind of. Hey, here's the if you want to call it the method to the badness is even though we've utilized or uh, we may not have used our number one picks on necessarily draft picks. Right. Uh, we might we definitely used them on going to get an all pro corner. Uh, right. The, the trade we just made. So instead of instead of using them on. Let's go to. Uh, a rookie, we've we've gone after more known commodities, but how can you still be fruitful in the draft? And, and by by utilizing, being disciplined with the, the comp formula, uh, you know we we've had a you know since 2017 we've had the eighth most draft picks in the league. You know, not number one, but the eighth most. Now on day one, Thursday, we're 32nd. We've had zero. Uh, but day three, day two, which is really your second, third round, we've had the third most. 
And there's an element there of the, the comp formula coming into play, right? We, we traded for Dante Fowler, uh, right? Heck, I mean, guy hit Drew Brees in overtime. John Johnson makes interception. We get a chance to go to the Super Bowl. Plays well for us, moves on, uh, you know, and, and we will more than likely get a third rounder this year. So that, you know, with those, you know, day two picks. And then we're six in day three picks in total number. Uh, the interesting thing, right, we're six in, 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 in receiving comp formula picks. And I do think after this year when they're announced, we'll probably move into the, you know, top three or two. And what's interesting, too, on that is we're fourth in the league in acquiring extra draft picks via trade, whether it's having the 31st pick, uh, you know, post-Super Bowl and trading, you know, not necessarily using it on a draft pick and, and trading back, but also uh, but also could be uh, hey, taking some of our veteran players like a Brandon Cooks and, and get, you know, receiving a second rounder, you know, giving a – so th th that's kind of the, I uh, call it the, the model, the method to the madness. And, and what that does take is discipline. And I, and I can't stress this enough. It takes a special uh, coaching staff. And they matter not only in, 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 you know, in, in, the, in partnering with, with front office, partnering with our scouting staff to, uh, to help identify players. And, and every player we identify, right, at each subset of the, the draft doesn't necessarily have to come in and become a, a starter, but there definitely needs to be a plan. Like we mentioned, Omar, and a lot of y'all, hey, what traits do they have in, that can help us fill a role? It definitely takes, right, development, not only from the coaches, but everybody in this building, you know, from the athletic performance staff, from the player engagement, helping these young players, uh, right, that were playing college football, you know, a, a year, some of them were playing high school three years ago, and to be able to handle the the, the pressure of coming to a team that that wants to win uh, now, and in the one of the things that's underrated is, is the coaching staff's courage to play those players. A good example this year, linebacker, right? We we were going into this year with an inexperienced group of of linebackers uh, in the first place, and we. Trayvon Howard, somebody we really liked, was having a really good camp, and and everybody was, I mean, just uh, Jack stoked about uh, how he, you know, was improving, how he was evolving, the the plays he were making, and, and then he had the unfortunate injury. Uh, but to have the for our coaching staff for us to sit down and and go, okay, you know what, let's have the courage to 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 uh, continue to model, uh, not necessarily go out and get. Uh, a veteran with experience, but to play the, the young players. What that does for you now is uh, just about everybody in that lock, that linebacker room has played and started games for us that we've won and big games. So it, it allows you to have this healthy depth. It allows you to figure out the sophomores maybe on your team that, that can help you. The, the Darius Williams is in time, the Troy Hill. So uh, that's the, the model. That's the method, right? You have these core players. You want and you know that that are pillars. Uh, definitely use uh, cap space and 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 cash and salary on those players, uh, but it will take discipline on the back end to utilize the draft uh, uh, and make the most of that. Even though when even when you are using uh, your number one picks for for known commodities and thing and, and and that type thing. So that's the. That's the model. Good question. I probably went longer than you wanted, Kevin. Uh, but yes, along the way, you're gonna you're gonna make some uh, mistakes. Are you gonna have more dead money than you want? Uh, right. I, I've said this, you know, even about Todd Gurley's dead money. There, there's not a moment uh, <laughs> you regret the the seasons he had for us and and what he meant, and even the the year we made the run to the Super Bowl, right? Uh, you want a yes/no question? Are, are you comfortable being in this situation with the cap? Uh, uh, yes, we the, the definitely uh, yes because again this 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 is an unprecedented year, but I do think uh, we've seen over the years uh, with teams that right have won cons consistently. Uh, Baltimore Ravens, Pittsburgh, see right there. There's an element, even New England Patriots. Uh, you know they. They had players that would 
uh, unfortunately have to move on. And but they, uh, when they moved on, they they uh, gained some comp picks. They used those comp pick wisely, and they they developed from within. And and they were still able to keep some core players. So I don't think it's anything anything that we're doing uh, really differently here, other than the fact, Kevin, that we we have we have determined that it might be beneficial to uh, use some of our late first round picks and even bet that we're going to have some later first round picks on the future uh, to get uh, known commodity commodities instead of rookies. Omar. And I say that Kevin is if we are winning and you are using cap, right? The reason I say you're comfortable with it is that usually means you're paying right quality players or that have at least been definitely uh, key contributors to you at some, you know, some time along the way, right? You, For instance, I'll say this, we'd rather pay Aaron Donald a lot of money than not have Aaron Donald but have his cap space, if that answers your question in a very simple Window, yeah. The amount of research and background you did on players before that, those visits were just kind of like a formality. So I'm wondering if, if that even matters anymore, not being able to have, you know, for the second year in a row, those free agency visits. If there is still value in that, I'm wondering, you know, how, what you learned last year going through that experience that you could apply this year in, in, in navigating, you know, this whole situation. Yeah, I, I, I actually think the, the age of the visit's a dinosaur. Uh, there'll still be a few, uh, but I, I do think that's 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 in the past. I even think, right, probably, I I, I would bet you you Omar maybe I mean Lindsay at ESPN. I would bet that we probably changed what I said was a debacle of the English language or the legal tampering period from uh, from let's call it starting on a Friday or Saturday. And ending on a Monday, uh, I bet you that was a. I bet you that was made with collaboration with networks. Going, hey, you know, there's no visits, and all the all the fun news occurs on a Saturday when you know y'all are hiking and not necessarily working per se. And and then by the time you ring the bell on Monday, it's like, well, you're all ready to phase, you know, basically probably see a free agency. So. I think yeah, I think that's why we started on Monday. Now I can't confirm that. Artists can confirm it with Mike. They may not admit it, but but I do think the age of the the visit's less important. Uh, the 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 part about the visit though that is important. Though, I, I think players will research organizations, uh, especially coaches, uh, with other players, uh, with people they trust, uh, maybe other co- you know things like that. Uh, they're pro- I mean, we're in a society now where, you know, the, I call it a commuting society where you can live somewhere else and go to work somewhere else. So I think that's that's not necessarily the thing. I think the one thing that still has to occur is, and and we saw it last year maybe with, with Mike Brockers, is, you know, no, at some point there has to be a visit and at some point there has to be a physical and there has to be, you know, a past physical to, to execute the contract and that would be the negative of this era is 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 when those visits don't happen right now and and they're delayed uh if there is a hiccup in the in the physical uh that could that could really uh that could, that could you know be negative dividends for both the club and the player right and the club being wait a minute they, they may you might not want to go to that club or sign early because oh wow they they failed some people in physicals in the past and we didn't all of a sudden have a seat at the table and and obviously a player could be hurt where he may have turned down other things and now he doesn't you know necessarily have a seat at the table but thanks Les. uh then we'll wrap up with Lindsay and jordan uh Les, i understand that andrew whitworth might play until he's like 60 years old but just in case he doesn't uh you guys drafted Joe Nobu to kind of 
kind of learn there and, and maybe take over there. Do you think that he has developed to the point where he could be um, or will be your left tackle if Andrew Whitworth um, eventually, when they retire, is bigger picture? Well, I mean, I think when Andrew's 60, Joe will be retired. So, But I, to answer your question, Joe played some really good snaps for us this year in meaningful games and, and proved uh, – Right, that it, it, keep it simple. You could you could watch a Rams game, and and usually when you're when you're uh, when you're discussing Joe Noteboom or Andrew Whitworth, it's usually when something went wrong. Right, it's it's not as fun to talk. Look at look at that guy making blocks down there. Right, it's usually holy cow. There's there's a lot of pressure or what have you coming from somewhere. So uh, I think that's definitely a a thumbs up for Joe and 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 it. So the, the way you project, right, you're always projecting with, with Joe's traits, even though he came from a spread offense where there's, we're never going to uh, execute that technique uh, that he came from from TCU. We're now going to have to, right, reteach him how we do things, uh, but you're betting on the traits, uh, did that. But the, the one time when you really know, right, uh, the one QB, let's say we could talk about, uh, right? We now know uh, uh, John Walford can be a backup QB. Why? He went in the game and played and won it, right? Not necessarily, okay, he had a really good scrimmage. You can start, okay, I, we might make that bet, which we did uh, last year, but you now somewhat confirm it when they actually get in the game and play it. I think Joe's done that. And then just also on your offensive line, um, with Austin Blythe uh, about to be a free agent, uh, if, if, he, if you guys aren't able to get him back, um, is Brian Allen in a place where he could take over at that position again, or is that a position you guys perhaps could be looking for? Yeah, I mean, I think that would if, – if Austin's not able – if we're not able to re-sign Austin, he's not – you know, he moves on. I do think uh, that's one position where uh, – the good thing with, with Brian Allen, similar to Joe, uh, he's actually started for us and played. Uh, the, the key, what we don't necessarily know with Brian is, you know, how will he play? How would he play post-injury? And, and that was a pretty serious injury that he's gone through, and he's done a heck of a job rehabbing it, and that's always going to be something he's got to do. But I do think you uh, – and the center, because it's such a nuanced uh, position of almost being the – the second QB on the field uh, that does that does it's it's hard just to project a rookie can do it. It's even hard just to project uh, you know a player that maybe with another NFL team uh, can do it. Uh, just because they 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 will still have to learn our system and still at that point uh, have to process you know uh, in and quickly process football within our system. So. A little bit harder to project than, than other positions. List, um, are you able to share a couple of names of non-starters from last season who you believe took in your evaluations and your, your pro staff evaluations took a jump um, from last year to this year, uh, considering you know you guys are in that sort of that, that's part of your model of developed talent coming in and contributing. Yeah, that's it. You know what? It. I I just looked at a page here. I mean, I I think I mentioned, you know, John Wofford. That's an obvious one, right? I, I don't I don't want to. I mean, I can mention Van Jefferson, but that that doesn't seem like a an unknown one, right? Uh, again, I I think uh, a good one that would might be would be uh, you know, a Xavier Jones. You know, I mean, heck, we're ready to run him. Uh, you know, down the stretch there in, in important games, but uh, you know, you know, Cam was able to to get through it and 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 be the warrior. But you know, it's players like him where uh, I call those are the sophomores. They may have played on special teams, and you know, I mean, yeah, I, I could mention a lot of them because even the, even the the runner we we signed claimed I forget what it was. I knew, you know, you know, Calais from from. Uh, Tampa and then Southwest Louisiana, and I'm—it's really not that they would get mad at me in Louisiana, but uh, I know as how this world works, right? Too Joe D. Camillus, who comes here, you know, he—he he was a big fan of Calais as a returner 
in Jacksonville, but now he's a Los Angeles Ram. So, uh, you know what's uh, I think it's similar to, I think we like uh, Big Tremaine Ancrum, right? Uh, again, didn't necessarily play in games. He did dress for a couple games, but going back to some of those camp practices, and you, you definitely you know saw some some things there. Uh, you know, you, you, an, a very interesting one is, is getting a, a Chandler Brewer back from an opt-out who actually played well in our San Francisco game way back in 19, uh, you know, when we went up there and, you know, geez, Louise, that, that game still bothers me that we lost that game, even though it might not have mattered at all. But uh, a little heavyweight fight, but he, he played well. So it's those moments. It's, hey, all of those defensive linemen we kept on practice squad. I probably couldn't even name them all, but there were four of them, and, and we kept them for a reason and, and liked them and, and, and those guys. The, the linebackers speak for themselves, and, and, and I think the sp- safeties, because a lot of those guys, you know, got to play. And even someone like, uh, you know, Mr. Reed that we signed from Jacksonville, uh, someone we really liked, really liked in the draft, uh, didn't get him. Uh, he went to Jacksonville. Uh, and, and then we ended up signing him. And, and so it, it's players like that that, uh, again, not household names, not uh, sexy, but sometimes you have to take the knowledge of Dow you have, make a bet on them to, to help play a role. And, and, and you know, it, again, the poster childs of that working out, Sebastian Joseph, Troy Hill, Darius, you know, Williams, things like that, uh, even, even to an extent the – you know the Kenny Youngs and 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 Troy Readers and, and and people like that. So those are those are kind of the the poster childs. It doesn't always work out, but uh, that's the vision. And I tried to mention a lot of names because if I just mention one or two, then if somebody's really listening to this long press conference, right, dude, the, the, is their feelings hurt? But. Gary, you got one more? All right. We appreciate you, Les. Appreciate y'all.